Hello everyone, um, my name is Christos Cholkas and I am a patron of the wonderful uh, organisation that is Writers Victoria. Thank you very much for uh, attending tonight. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, land that was never ceded and I want to pay my respects to the custodians and first storytellers of these lands past, present and emerging. It's been one of the most exciting things about this recent period uh, to read the absolutely stunning work being done for, by First Nations uh, people. And I'm, we all here at Writers Victoria want to acknowledge that, uh, that fact. Um, this is the second time um, I am presenting, uh, introducing rather, the state of the writing nation oration. Um, under the rules of COVID. So I apologise firstly for my hair. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to have a haircut yet. I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, the State of the Writing uh, Oration is one of the uh, key events on the Writers Victoria calendar. Uh, Writers Victoria, um, as many of you know who are members, is an organisation that is there to advocate for um, and to encourage and to liaise between and with writers um, in the state of Victoria. It has been especially important work, it always is, but over the last two years because of just the difficulties of the pandemic and the fact that so many people uh, have, have had to struggle uh, because of the conditions of the, of the pandem pandemic. Fortunately, there's a light now at the end of the tunnel that we can all see, um, but uh, um, it's, it's been uh, a real honour to be uh, a member of Writers Victoria over this very difficult period and to see the work and support the organisation has given to, to writers. I want to uh, uh, explain that all uh, proceeds coming from the State of the Writing Nation oration will go to the Writers Victoria Fund which is a fund set up to uh, help writers throughout this state who are experiencing financial difficulties. Uh, again, because of the pandemic, that uh, the, the fund is absolutely crucial in nurturing and protecting the rights of uh, writers. So I would encourage any of you who are listening who are not members of Writers Victoria to please uh, uh, please think of uh, taking out a membership for the support of this organisation and for the support that, that they do. Um, I know when I first started as a writer in Melbourne, if it wasn't for Writers Victoria being taking me seriously, telling I had no idea about where you would go as a writer to get support. I, w I, was, a very, I was very green um, to that world and it was Writers Victoria who first took me seriously. Um, and said, yeah, if you want to be a writer, you can be. Uh, that was an astonishing thing for a very young person to hear, <laughs> to be taken seriously. I'm always, I'm always proud to, um, to introduce this oration. Um, we've had wonderful people in the past uh, do the oration and it is a space created uh, to allow a writer, an established writer, to talk about the culture, the politics, the issues, their perceptions of what is happening in the writing space in, in Australia at this very moment, the here and now. Um, it's, uh, oh, I should add too that it is an initiative of Writers Victoria, but it would, um, we are also very, very grateful for the support of the Wheeler Centre, uh, their support of the organisation in general and also for the State of the Writing Nation oration. Um, uh, it, we are indeed very lucky in this state to have something like the Wheeler Centre supporting the arts. Um, it is with an absolute pleasure that I want to introduce Alice Poon uh, as our keynote speaker tonight. I have I've adored Alice's work from when I first read um, Unpolished Gem um, some, some time ago and I've always been admiring and 
Uh, more than admiring. I love Ellison's writing. I think uh, 100 Days is one of the best books published this year. I'm very happy to sing that praise as loud as I can. Alice, apart from being one of our greatest storytellers, is also someone who, in every dealing I've had with her, and I think with every, every dealing that um, all of you who know her have had, uh, she has shown incredible integrity, uh, incredible courage, uh, and incredible fearlessness um, in how she approaches uh, being a writer and also being a human person in, in, in this world. I am absolutely convinced that um, what she will be, uh, that the oration that she will be giving tonight will be challenging, that it will be affirming and human, um, and that it will create um, conversation. Uh, uh, it, yeah, so yes, an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Alice Pung um, as the speaker tonight. Uh, one of the great uh, things about the, uh, the oration is that the writer, the established writer, can choose an emerging writer to, um, to also present their work uh, to, to all of you tonight. That is a wonderful opportunity. Um, the, the thing about being an emerging writer is finding the space uh, to have your work read and have your work heard. Uh, Alice has chosen Shuling Chua tonight um, and I am excited to be welcoming Shuling to, uh, to, to the oration. Um, that's enough of, uh, from me. Um, I, again, I would like to remind you that all the uh, funds uh, from the, um, the event tonight are going to the Writers Victoria Fund. Uh, that is supporting all writers who are facing financial difficulties at the moment. Incredibly important work. I would also like to um, encourage you, if you are not uh, a member as yet, to join Writers Victoria. Uh, whether you're a, um, an, an emerging writer of whatever age or whether you're an established writer, there is something about the collectivity of being in it together that is um, is important and a pivotal part of the work Writers Victoria does. Again, I want to thank uh, the organisation Writers Victoria for for the work they do. Um, thank you for letting me be your patron, and I also want to thank the Wheeler Centre for the encouragement and the support of this night. Uh, to make donations to uh, the Writing, Writers Victoria Fund, you can go to uh, the Writers Victoria webpage and follow the link to the uh, uh, to the fund itself, or you can go to the Wheeler Centre uh, website and there will be a link uh, to Writers Victoria there. With absolute pleasure, I give you Alice and Xu Ling. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me tonight. My name is Xu Ling Chua. I'm so happy to be opening for Alice tonight. Thank you, Alice. Um, I've really, really loved your work since the first time I read it in late 2007. Thank you so much for encouraging us baby writers and for reminding us that writing is just one aspect of who we are. Tonight, I'll be reading an excerpt from an essay titled Shades of Longing. Drawing one's curtains signals a desire for privacy, but curtains also tease. Say, I know something that you don't. Say, I may reveal all or part. Curtains hint at languid summer evenings. Blinds and shutters are sharp, efficient, one-dimensional, whereas curtains are flowing organic fluid. Curtains pull, curtains dance, curtains brush one skin. Curtains sucked against window as sharp inhale, then exhale. Sigh, tremble, whisper, that puff of warm air against one's ear when a lover leans in flickering in and out of consciousness, ragged breath, lace floats, 
hovers, sails. The image of the Anjonui, framed in her upstairs window or leaning against a balcony, is a universal symbol of longing. From Shakespeare's Juliet to Eileen Chang's naive schoolgirl, Go Wei Long. From Britney's Lucky to Sunmi's Porapip Bam. She is looking out as we are looking in. We are all her. I used to dance in the living room of my apartment, curtains undrawn, eyes fixed on the glass door to the balcony. I wanted to know how I looked. The line of my limbs, the way my wrists flicked, fingers unfurling. In 2018, I started shifting from the highly confessional to work that reflected my interests. I'm learning, I said to friends, to write about happiness. To write memoir is to constantly navigate the space between private and public, between past and present. I was learning to set physical boundaries and boundaries in my writing. I turned to poetry and lyric essays. Blur leaves space for the viewer to insert themselves, space for interpretation, space for the mingling of experiences, meanings and truths. It is an acknowledgement of life's complexity. Blurry, however, is not the same as murky. The objective is not to exclude or obfuscate, but to stay open to softness, to invite the reader in. In Liu Zhiqian's self-portraits, the artist is obscured behind a screen, or part of her body is revealed in the mirror. In one photo, only her hand is visible, reaching towards an iris in the foreground. In another, an arm arches from a vase, mimicking a pale pink rose. A hand reaches towards its mirror image. Tulips cradle Liu's spine and shoulder. What or who is the prop? Liu hopes to create a small world in her works, a space which belongs to the artist and the viewer. It has become very rare to have the opportunity to be alone, she notes. The self-portrait is a way to communicate with herself. I feel most free when I'm alone. A lot of people think of loneliness when they think of being alone, Liu says. But I think loneliness is sometimes used for enjoyment. To enjoy solitude is to discover beauty. One evening, the summer after I left Canberra, the skirt hem of a lady alighting from the tram puffed heavenward. The image, the gesture is seared in my memory. Another morning, as the train lurched between stations, I noticed signs in the tunnel specifying the distance to Flagstaff relative to Melbourne Central. In which direction would you run? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My friend Shu Ling Chua, um, in her beautiful reading, talked about how she wanted to write with true emotion and not just technically well. Shu Ling said, I want to write from the heart. I want to make people feel something. So tonight I'd like to talk about three main aspects of writing, about its production, about promotion, and about its reception. And I would like to explore the idea of whose feelings matter in literature in relation to these three aspects. And of course, as a writer, I'd like to do this by throwing in a few stories as well. So let me begin. When I was younger, my mother's rage over the phone company overcharging us a couple of dollars was humiliating. 
So while I was trying to politely explain the error to the telecom people on the other end, she'd be yelling in the background and I'd be trying my best to maintain my composure because I was pretending to be my mother at 14 over the phone and trying not to sound like a raging, crazy ethnic myself. And I would be livid that she couldn't hold it all together. In her book, Minor Feelings, the author Kathy Hong Park writes, one characteristic of racism is that children are treated like adults and adults are treated like children. Watching a parent being debased like a child is the deepest shame. To grow up Asian in America, or in our case in Australia, is to witness the humiliation of authority figures like your parents and to learn not to depend on them. They can't protect you. But I felt I had a superpower over my mother. I felt I could read people's minds and she couldn't. I could read the minds of old people, moribund men who lived a century ago, Indian people under colonization, defiant teenagers in America, and important people who had things to say. And anyhow, no one in literature sounded much like my mother. Even Amy Tan's Ma Jong playing mothers were more articulate, always giving sage life advice to their daughters through anecdotes and myths. But this was much my fault as it was the fault of a dearth of diverse books. Never as a child did I even consider whether my mother was introverted or extroverted, humorous or shy around other people. She just didn't speak enough English to have a personality. And from the age of eight, I thought exclusively in English. And the more educated I became as a teenager and then a young adult, the more I had to learn to speak and write about complex ideas in a way that a bright 12 year old could understand because that's how old my mother was when all her formal education stopped. As the very first part of ethnic cleansing in Cambodia, they closed down all the Chinese schools when she was in grade one, so she can't even read or write very well in her first language. And later she became an adult with enormous power over us, and we had to be careful not to make her feel stupid because she felt that way a lot of the time, and it made her feel powerless and so very, very angry. My mother was a force to be reckoned with indoors, but outside she was silent. A cashier giving us the wrong change could easily be rectified, but for her it was a major calamity. She didn't have the words to get the money back or she'd bring home dish detergent instead of shampoo because they were both on sale on a similar shelf in the supermarket and both had organic looking flowers and fruit on the bottles. Recently, she put my baby in an outfit she brought on sale from Kmart and she said, oh, geez, this dress was only a dollar because I think it's stitched all wrong. It's got all these extra holes in it. She couldn't read the label that said dog costume. And when I told her, she just laughed and shook her head because, you know, some of our dogs in Australia own more clothes than the children of Cambodia. So I stand before you today with this great honor of giving the State of the Writing Nation address, but I go back to a mother whose sole literature comes once a week in the letterbox, the Woolworths and Coles ads with their half price specials. She'd get a pen and circle the things she wanted to buy and then go out and buy them. Now, during this pandemic, these circles became darker and angrier because my mother could no longer go out, but had to rely on the good mood of my father to open up his laptop and perform the alchemy of typing in the magic that would result in an online shop and delivery. So every day I'm reminded of this privilege, the privilege of being able to read labels on food and more importantly, medication, and to be able to write a list of things to do every day. And this is where my talk begins. The debates about who is more privileged and less, who has a right to talk for whom, and when and where and why, all these fall into some context when you're dealing with illiteracy almost every day of your life. And this evening is about and for disadvantaged writers. Any person who's disadvantaged in some way as an immigrant, refugee, indigenous, disabled, queer, poor, They'll tell you that they often don't have the luxury of having their true feelings, thoughts and personalities publicly recognise. And I don't mean in our writing. Some of us can't even write. I mean in our everyday lives. The best we can do is blend in and not to speak our language so loudly in public, lest our ching chong be construed as crafty slanders or our Arabic greeting be seen as a call to literal arms 
Our comment about this possession dismissed as an inability to let go of the past or our public scowling because our back hurts or some idiots just patted our guide dog when they're not supposed to as a sign that we are not one of those good, inspiring, disabled people. Often, true feelings make us feel vulnerable. And that's why I listen to this great station on the radio called 3AW. Sure, I like the ABC with its carefully crafted programs, and I really like Virginia, but I also like listening to talkback radio, especially listening to the first time callers. You know the sorts of callers I mean, their names are Narelle or Daryl, and when they get on air for the first time, there is a three second silence, completely stunned because this is the first time they've been listened to. Someone's listening to them at last. And after that three second stunned silence, Suddenly, there's the vitriol, the words that they're trying and struggling to get out, you know, oh, oh, Neil, oh, I'm live, am I? Oh, you know, you're not going to like this, Neil, I've got something to say, and I've just got to say it. And so we, you know, as a more enlightened audience, or so we think we are, we listen to these people who are heard for the very first time in their lives publicly, and we think, oh, they're speaking English all wrong, they're spluttering, they're spewing. We got to give them to Neil Mitchell, patron saint of patience, because we don't want to deal with those types. So when asked about how he managed to write about a dissatisfied, adulterous young French woman, the French writer Flaubert said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Sorry about my Australian accent. So, you know, Madame Bovary, that's me. And you know, Daryl on 3AW, that's also me. The racist vitriol Daryl says, I've also felt. That's what racism does to a person. It makes you always put yourself in the shoes of the other to understand their feelings, not because you are more empathetic and a better person, but on a more practical level, so you can then modify yourself lest you get a broken bottle top shoved in your face back in Braybrook, or you lose out on a job opportunity in your middle class life. And so we think, Oh, finally, literature is a good place for us to share our feelings, our language, our inner lives. Literature is a refuge. Literature and the literary world is a refined place far, far away from the Daryls on 3AW. But you know what? We are wrong. Because when I was 25, I didn't understand many things about the writing world, but I had a hunch. If you have ever seen the movie The Castle, I had a vibe. And that vibe has persisted for one and a half decades. And today I want to tell you about it, this vibe, Dennis DiNudo style. And you can say to me, ah, oh, you've got to be kidding me. But it was this vibe that got me to begin the first sentence of my very first book with, this story does not begin on a boat. Because I wanted to write an Australian book, and all the books about yellow people back then had to begin someplace else, even the ones about Goldfields Asian Australians back two centuries ago. So this persistent, unremitting vibe was what got me last week, an online writers' conference, to declare and apologise and cajole with jokes and console with good humour and promise that this is not going to be boring without even seeing my audience because the title of my talk was Writing for Diversity. Now, quite a few times at conferences, I have experienced half the room walking out in real life when I've had to do a talk on diversity or multiculturalism. You know, I've never taken it personally, but let me tell you this, those people who walk out have never been minorities or people of colour, and these multicultural sessions are usually slotted in before lunch or after lunch in the crappy spots when people were too hungry or too tired to listen. In the last 15 years, I've tried to look at the world from the perspective of agents, publishers, editors, marketers, because these are the people who are supposed to know better than you about the book industry and who really want to sell your book and help you out, because that's true. But you know what? I also know a little bit about selling, because when I was younger, I worked at my dad's electrical appliance store. So I have sold literal stereotypes. And I've also had the humiliation of old grannies come up to me when I've approached them with my best customer service smile and asking how I can help. They've come up to me and said, oh, love, can you get me an Australian salesperson, please? 
and I would obligingly grab Joe, who was Italian, or Jim, who was Macedonian, and my dad, who owned the store, would also sometimes ask Jim to pretend to be the owner, because that's what we do. We Asians remain invisible. We do the hard work. We don't mind giving other people the credit, as long as our self-dignity is intact. Arseholes of any colour or creed are not afraid to kick up a stink with a Cambodian refugee store owner in a way that they would never ever do in Maya or Harvey Norman. And if you get enough complaints from these people, head office will question your suitability in operating their franchise business. So you give in in small ways so you don't have to give up in big ways. So I can honestly say I've spent half my life working in retail at my dad's shop. I've done some child labour as an outworker's daughter, and I've also made a few books. So I'm not a publisher, but I do know a little bit about the production, promotion, and reception of white goods and brown goods. That's an industry joke, by the way. It's what we call fridges and hi-fi equipment. But it's also how we kind of divide literature, if we're going to be honest with ourselves. White goods and brown goods. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the production now. The writer Anne Boyer writes that in order to live, and I say live, not write, the vast majority of people have to sell their hours of their lives at work. So there's a distinct difference between a poor or working class voice and a middle class voice, and the former is always acutely aware of the latter, but the same courtesy is not vice versa extended. Emily Maguire introduced me to the work of the late great Grace Paley, who talked about the importance of blood and money in writing. Grace Paley said, it's possible to write about anything in the world, but the slighter story ought to contain the facts of money and blood in order to be interesting to adults. That is, everybody continues on this earth by courtesy of certain economic arrangements. And blood, the way people live as families or outside families or in the creation of family, sisters, sons, fathers, the bloody ties, trivial work ignores these two facts. But you know, Anne Boyer notes that there is a different sort of vibe happening in much popular literature today. She says, I sometimes imagine some alien reader picking up a contemporary novel and thinking that everything about our species in our time and place was feelings, self-identification, self-interest, self-fulfillment, self-determination. Writers of disadvantage don't have this luxury because every day we are made aware, whether we like it or not, of our bodies, our possessions, our class, our colour. And then we have to make these readers, presumably with more heightened and hallowed sensitivities than our own, care about what we have to say. Kathy Hong Park says, Patiently educating a clueless white person about race is draining. It takes all of your powers of persuasion because it's more than a chat about race. It's ontological. It's like explaining to a person why you exist or why you feel pain or why your reality is distinct from their reality. Except it's even trickier than that because the person has all of Western history, politics, literature and mass culture on their side proving that you don't exist. The writer Shannon Burns says that the difference between disadvantaged people's lives and comfortable people's lives is this. Strong class enforced safety nets means that self-pity can be accommodated and victimhood can even form part of a functional identity. So I've always been interested in what happens to comfortable people when they encounter the suffering of the disadvantaged and, you know, something repels them. Something compels them not to believe it or us. Unfortunately, disadvantaged writers, the truly disadvantaged, make this suspension of disbelief easier for you because they don't harp on about why they're disadvantaged or how they're disadvantaged. They're the last to apply for writing residencies, for fellowships and funding if they even know how. And when they do their applications, they don't know how to highlight exactly what they need. And in one case, it was a literal computer. So disadvantaged is not another identity they can cast on or off, but a material reality, a true lack of time and resources. And Shannon Burns says, indeed, the willingness to expose your wounds is another sign of privilege. 
Those for whom injury has a use value will display their injuries and those for whom woundedness is a survival risk won't. The poet Emily Dickinson wrote, Tell the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. The truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. So you know what we have to do? We have to tell the truth, but we have to tell it slant. And when I was writing my second book called Her Father's Daughter, my dad, on whose life it was based, he kept asking me anxiously. He said, oh, do you think there's too much suffering in this book? You know, there might be a bit too much suffering. White people don't want to read about too much suffering. You've got to be really careful here. So that's a problem with having the feelings of the minority writer. You have the inconvenient truth of suffering in your life like, for example, the killing fields of Cambodia. And sometimes the silver lining is this, is that this suffering puts other sufferings into perspective so that a Rwandan mother of five and a heavily pregnant me can work together across an ocean with an urgency that transcends our own feelings. Last year, I had the great honour of mentoring Faina, my next chapter fellow from Tasmania. She and her husband, Orbert, had a house full of children. They were both working and she just had major surgery. And over the course of six months, she sent me about 80,000 words, a gripping manuscript about surviving the Rwandan genocide. And she said to me, and she kept saying to me, Alice, this lockdown has been good to me. It's been so good. It's given me precious time to finish my book. And I salute writers like Faina and Albert who work in spite of their feelings and in spite of these circumstances. And now when a disadvantaged writer, by some miracle, finally finishes their work, then, then they have to seriously consider who will take them on. And this is no small feat, considering the mainstream publishing industry doesn't particularly like the way we tell trauma. And if you think I'm exaggerating, you haven't heard how many others have coveted Faina and Orbert's story and the things they've wanted to do with it. You haven't had the privilege of befriending another talented writer who works at a high school as a teacher to disadvantage kids by day and writes about war by night and is rejected by publisher after publisher for her work's grim subject matter. And you know who else writes grim subject matter in almost every work of theirs? Helen Garner. Because you know what? Shit happens. But marginalised writers then have to perform the alchemy that transforms this effluence into something very similar to the poo emoticon, perfectly shaped, smiling with good humour and odourless, in order for our writing to be initially picked up by a publisher. And I really, truly don't believe I could have got her father's daughter published without writing Unpolished Gem first. And to this day, Her Father's Daughter is my most critically acclaimed book, but my slowest moving baby in terms of sales. While the others are walking unassisted, she's still crawling. And that's fine, because every once in a while, someone will pick her up and carry her somewhere, like the wonderful writer Dr. Melanie Cheng, who chose her as her 2020 lockdown read and remarked on its light and unsentimental touch and its laugh out loud humour qualities reviewers rarely attribute to non-fiction books about genocide. And why is this? Because our books are, to the average reader's mind, meant to be didactic. They're meant to teach something. And readers, the average reader, think they've read enough of these sorts of books to kind of know the formula. But it's not really their fault, because really what they've read are books published to educate, not to reflect the full spectrum of our personalities, thoughts and feelings because to a privileged reader's emotional health, the disadvantaged writer is either a vitamin-rich supplement, really unappetizing but necessary, or they're like dark chocolate, not only palatable but irresistible, sparking off all the endorphins. And we are only dark chocolate if we've been blessed with the education necessary to turn neat tricks with language, or if we've been blessed to look like Iranian Jesus. So vitamins or chocolate, notice how these comestibles exist to service the consumer. 
because I make no bones about it, publishing is a business, but it shouldn't be a factory. And my friend May know the anthropologist, critic and academic, once worked in a third world factory production line. And she says this, I worked in that Cambodian factory as I helped make those cheap looking useless sunglass cases next to a 17 year old who most likely would be doing many more years of this. I could imagine these cases ending up in discount bins or $2 shops somewhere in Australia. And it hurt to think that we had ruined our backs and strained our eyes for something that could and would be discarded so easily, so cheaply, our labor meaning almost nothing at all. And this is exactly what happens when I see memoirs of refugees in the $10 bargain basement bins. I see lives discarded, voices unmentored, stories extracted with surgical precision from still bleeding souls who once believed their words would change lives or at least change their lives. And I'm saying to these publishers, look, I know you need to make money, but why churn out these stories in this manner? Seriously, sometimes if the writer is not yet skilled enough, they even get a ghostwriter to do it. And I think, come on, why not cool down a bit? Why not help that marginalized survivor writer find a mentorship and let them take four years to find their voice and develop a literary personality? What's the rush? And come on, why the rush? Are we just fads and interchangeable cutouts? Like, oh, we've done Bosnia this year, but we don't have someone for, from Iran or Afghanistan. Who can find Afghanistan on a map? I'm not kidding you there. I have been asked by publishers, can you find me a writer of this specific ethnicity, of this specific suffering, of this specific circumstance, because this war is going on? And all these publisher rush stories of pain and redemption make people think that we're hard work, even before they meet us. And that's why 15 years ago, I politely pushed back on another thing with my first book, in the same way my friend Maxine Benneber Clark pushed back on hers. So I had a wonderful team, and I still do at my publishers, and they presented me, and not many publishers do this, but they presented me with a number of covers, I think three it was. One had a pattern on it, another one had a different pattern, and the third one had a photograph. And that was the one the publishers really liked. And the photograph was black and white, and that was a whole cover. And it was of a girl in a darkened room. And in the back of the room, there was this open dark doorway. And she was sitting on a bed, and she was in a white dress or something. And she was an Asian girl, about you know nine years old. And she was sitting there looking glum and depressed. And I showed my dad the cover. I said, Dad, look, this is a cover they want to put on my book. What do you think of it? And my dad said, oh, no. Look at this cover. They're going to be thinking your book is about sexual assault. I'm like, oh, sh shit. <laughs> There's nothing about that in my book. My book is meant to be a funny book about growing up in the western suburbs of Footscray. So I went back to my publishers and I politely said, listen, I don't think I can have the cover of the Asian girl in the dress in that darkened room. And they also wrote a blurb for me. And the blurb I could see that they tried really hard because they wanted to promote my book. But I couldn't have that blurb about the three generations of suffering Chinese women either. So you know what? I got that email, I got that cover, and I, I gave myself a go. I had a go at rewriting the blurb. And I started with, this story does not begin on a boat, nor does it contain wild swans or falling leaves. And how lucky I was, how blessed to have my editor, Chris Fike, who found me by reading Maxine Hong Kingston's work and who thought I had a similar kind of voice. And he wrote back to me, Dear Alice, your blurb was exactly what the doctor ordered. How lucky. And how lucky I was to have a designer, Tom, who actually redid the cover to the recognizable orange one that's been in print for 15 years now. This year, it's its 15th year anniversary. And how lucky I was to have that small and careful team without an expert panel of marketers to dictate and override my vehement objection to that first cover, that three generations of suffering Chinese women blurb. How lucky I was to have a team who recognized my personhood and who took these risks. Because sometimes we minority writers are not as clueless as we look. Sometimes we see things differently to the way they were ever done before, and it might just work. And so I'd like to honor all those publishers and agents and editors who've genuinely taken risks. 
and I'm not going to lie here, sometimes our work is hard work to read, as it should be. Nearly everyone has bought or been given a copy of No Friend But The Mountains, but you know what? Barely anyone I know has read it, except for Arnold Zabel, of course. I haven't read it myself, but you know, I seriously have an excuse. Publishers are constantly sending me an endless stream of books to endorse. Books about the death of children, books about the death of loved ones, books about stabbings, books about refugees, books about genocide, books about killings, and every imaginable kind of trauma. And um, of course, I, I endorse these books because, you know, <laughs> I'm genuinely interested and, and some of them are just extraordinary. But can you imagine if I said, oh, mate, this stuff is triggering to me or I'm not feeling up to it, I'm too busy. But sometimes I do suggest, why don't you get X or Y big name author to do it? Oh, yeah, but they're too busy. Or sometimes, flatteringly, the publicist will write back to me and say, oh, but you're a big name, Alice. And you know what? I don't buy that. Because Viet Tan Nguyen, who is a huge name, who won the Pulitzer Prize, you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning name, says, many writers like me have been called a voice for the voiceless. It's what we trot out whenever someone is writing about an experience we don't know anything about. It's meant to be a compliment but it's dangerous because when we call someone a voice for the voiceless, what we're really saying is, oh, we don't, want to, we don't really wanna hear all those other voices that are out there. It's easier to deal with this one person. So here I would like to sincerely thank Helen Garner. She wrote a supporting sentence on the cover of my first book and she even launched it at Melbourne Writers' Festival. And now in her 80s, she's still judging writing competitions for emerging writers. I cannot imagine the level of success Unpolished Gem would have had without Helen's support. Helen has always done the hard work to help disadvantaged writers. And I say to everyone, listen, if Helen Garner is not precious about her name being on debut books, then I'm not sure what excuse everyone else has except perhaps some degree of literary wankiness. So you've all heard of the Bechdel test. I'm proposing a new one here. And as an act of wankery, I call it the Pung Test. So when you go to writers' festivals, I'd like you to sit there and I'd like you to count how many times you hear an Aboriginal writer, a disabled writer or a refugee writer, A, talk about their writing process at length when unprompted. Oh, I burn a candle or it took me a while to think about these sentences and I had my cat dog with me and oh, or B, talk about their fictional characters without any context, as if everyone already knows them, as if these fictional characters were in the room with us. Because can you imagine this in any other profession? Can you imagine a panel of accountants sitting there in a line talking to us about the accounting process and how they do it? Oh, I take this spreadsheet and I add these numbers in this column. Question from the audience, please. Or yes, is there a specific reason and significance to why you chose to name column A expendables? Oh, let me think about that. Well, we minority writers don't have this luxury. We have the weight of history on our shoulders. We have to do stand-up comedy and literary handstands in order for half the room to literally, you know, not walk out because the next session is someone else. We don't assume people have read our books and know our characters or will even want to buy our books and know our characters. We have to hustle the shit out of them. And even then, there are no guarantees on how we'll be received. Because let's talk now about reception. Jessie too. Jessie too, I'm a fan of you. Jessie too wrote her book to write a character like herself into existence. And she says that because she didn't see people like her as active agents in books, I felt ineligible for anything like an adventure or love. So sad, isn't it? Ineligible for anything like an adventure or love. In interviews, Jessie says a lot of very insightful, thoughtful things about representation and reading and her love of jazz. But when her first book came out, she's quoted in the Guardian newspaper in huge black byline letters as saying, 
I will probably never read a book by a straight white male again, as if that's her life's creed, when I would imagine it would have been a throwaway flippant line during an interview, because we've all done interviews before, when we've relaxed and said these th throwaway lines, because Jessie can also be funny. And the point she was trying to make is that really privileged people can not only tell their stories, but then they feel the need to tell our stories as well. And that's why they're too busy to read and endorse our books. And they think, oh, lucky Benjamin Law, Maxine, Anita Heiss, Arnold Zabel, Tony Burge, Randa Abdul Fattah, Christos, Rebecca Lim, huge names, by the way, <laughs> are making time to help out the fellow debut writers. And phew, now our famous straight white selves can go back to character building our transgender Vietnamese sidekick characters because our imagination is infinite, infinitely superior. Our literary output more important. Now the Irish writer Sally Rooney was the number one debating champion in all of Europe when she was aged just 22. And she says about this experience, I knew almost nothing about Bosnia, but now my English language upbringing had deposited me at the top of a lecture hall in Belgrade, where I was falsifying the history of a devastating and prolonged conflict. The most ambitious debaters go out of their way to absorb information about sexual violence, racial profiling, police brutality, issues many of them will never experience firsthand. I did exactly the same thing. Did it make me more empathetic and self-aware? Or did it just continue to affirm the idea that if I were smart enough and competitive enough, I could speak for anyone I wanted? And if we take the commercial publishing industry as a whole and as an average, and I'm not talking about the outliers or the small presses, then the commercial publishing industry is a little bit like our Sally Rooney, hardworking, supremely talented, highly likable, self-aware at every level, but powerful enough to amplify the voices of anyone they want. And fortunately, Sally had this acute awareness at 22 and wasn't egotistical enough or calculating enough to shove in some people of color in her books. And she's transparent about how little awareness her young characters have outside themselves and the people they know, other brilliant progressive people with huge ideas and little outside life experience. I know these people and I like these people. These people are students, you know. <laughs> and one of the most exasperating questions I'm asked when I'm giving writing workshops by well-intentioned participants is this, how do I write diverse characters? And I think, well, at least these earnest beginner writers are asking instead of just going ahead and using their fame and fortune and acclaim to just do it, you know. <laughs> and I also think, you know, if you had diverse people in your life, a best friend maybe, a family member, a student that you mentor, you wouldn't be asking me because you'd be asking them instead. There's a proximity, a closeness, a friendship that you can call upon. Many of the high school students and university students I teach writing to, they do diversity beautifully. Their characters are real, true characters and not assemblages of cultural quirks. They don't even mention ethnicity in their work because they're just writing about their best friends and their best friend's parents. Carrie Tiffany spoke once about how a lot of adults write children terribly. She jokes that one day these children will say, how dare you appropriate our voices? But many writers, agents, and publishers feel the need to tell the stories of disadvantaged people a certain way, especially to children, because they want a sanitized version that they can live with. And what they're saying is, essentially, we're too good. Our children are too good to be inflicted pain by you. I've had the uncanny experience a few times, not just once, not just twice, but a few times of really well-intentioned teachers at schools telling me to tone down my recounting of my dad's experiences in the killing fields or the background history of the killing fields, even while sending me to their schools and to their children to educate them. So this pandemic has been interesting in the way we use language and what we're allowed to say, because this pandemic has brought about the liberal and unfettered, unabashed use of words like fragile to describe our children's mental states. And in the case of one school principal recently who defied lockdown laws, cries that our children are hurting. And I secretly thought, 
listen, mate, I know you want the best for your children, but what makes your children so special? What about the children I work with in the Western suburbs, locked inside commission flats who dare not defy the government and police, who are scared of these people, who are sometimes trapped with emotionally and physically abusive adults in their lives, who are taking care of elderly relatives while simultaneously doing their schoolwork on Zoom and homeschooling a couple of younger siblings as well? When do they get to be fragile and hurting? And I think, gosh, now we know how you really feel. For when you talk about fragility, you're not just talking about the children. You're talking about yourselves. You're talking about grown adults. I never blame privilege on the children, but I swear these adults have a lot to answer for. Kathy Hong Park writes that innocence is both a privilege and a cognitive handicap, a sheltered unknowingness that once protracted into adulthood hardens into entitlement. I've had a whole lifetime of not telling my parents bad news. They've survived war, starvation, loss, death of their parents, death of a child. And I suppose from this, I also instinctually learnt how to make suffering palatable for fragile readers. Because you know the kind of read I'm talking about, well-versed in the language of micro and even nano aggressions. I made that up, by the way, <laughs> very woke, yet certain books are too traumatic for them. And I call this IBS, Irritable Book Syndrome. Holden Shepard tells suicidal gay men who pick up his book and feel like crap and think that he has the answers and wants to read it. He says, look, mate, don't read my book because it's going to make you feel worse if you're in this state. These epiphanies only come when you're in a good place. And I tell people they might not like my new book if they're anxious in lockdown. Seriously, we're not all assholes, <laughs> but comfortable, safe people who claim to care so much about education and learning their own and their children's, but whose feelings are too delicate for this shit. No sympathy. In her book regarding the pain of others, Susan Sontag writes, someone who is perennially surprised that depravity exists, who continues to feel disillusioned and even incredulous when confronted with evidence of what humans are capable of inflicting in the way of gruesome, hands-on cruelties upon other humans, has not reached moral or psychological adulthood. No one after a certain age has the right to this kind of innocence, of superficiality, to this degree of ignorance or amnesia. And Maria Tumarkin last year said, I am not in the market for fantasies of innocence. I studied history. Maria also says, centering empathy is one of the most familiar moves in the settler innocence playbook, which should make us squeamish about using this term. Susan Sontag again says, so far as we feel sympathy, we feel we are not accomplices to what caused the suffering. Our sympathy pro proclaims our innocence. Viet Tan Nguyen muses, what happens if we don't do anything? What happens if we just put down that book and pick up another book? What happens if we don't get involved in an aid organization and donate money? What happens if we don't call out our elected officials? What happens if we don't march in the streets? What happens if we don't take action? I think that's the danger of literature. As much as it awakens our feelings, it can also lull us into a sense of complacency that we've already done something by simply reading about someone else's terrible situation. My friend, the academic Natalie Conyu, says her acknowledgement of country, and then she takes it further. She says, now we've acknowledged we're on stolen land, let's do something about it. Let's make the commitment to pay back some rent. It could be as small as every time you hear an acknowledgement of country donating a dollar to an Indigenous foundation. And I thought, gosh, what a bloody brilliant idea. And yet how about we don't just confine our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander speakers to doing that acknowledgement of country and then booting them out of the room or the Zoom because they're only there to serve as the entree to our larger feast of important cultural learnings. And if you don't know that reference, it's from Borat. And by not engaging the refugee speaker, the Muslim speaker, the disability advocate, 
You make your learning about us a parody. And also, seriously, you've got to reevaluate your life if you feel like you must use books to educate children about diversity because your kid is bereft of diverse people in their lives. You're giving books too much power here. Books should complement and not replace the full spectrum of humanity. William Hazlitt wrote that the smallest pain in our little finger causes us more concern than the destruction of our fellow human beings. So unless we can transcend our physical and emotional corporeality, our feelings do matter more than everyone else's. That's a statement of fact, not a judgment on selfishness. Our feelings are the way we experience the world and the cause of all our desires, friendships and enmities. But unless we can transcend our feelings for a little bit and acknowledge some real hard truths, we'll never have any idea how to fix this problem called diversity, representation and appropriation. Audre Lorde wrote almost 30 years ago, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those who have been forged in the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It's learning how to take our differences and make them strengths, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I'm afraid to say that that master is still alive and the master has the same sensitivities as a 19th century romantic poet at times, and the master is not dying of consumption anytime soon. And he may, out of the kindness of his heart, or even self-interest, spend his time painting the outside of his house rainbow colours so that people of all cultures, classes and creeds feel welcome. But he may also very likely warn us to please wipe off our crap and mud on the welcome mat first in case we foul up the sitting room. Because we still seem to be the white man's burden, but this new white person is now a woke publisher marketer who knows what sorts of our stories we can tell because they have a vibe on what sorts of stories might sell. But now there are other places we can go. And you know what? How far we have gone in 15 years since I first started out. When my latest book came out in the middle of this year, it was reviewed mainly by women of colour and Asian women, Tui On, Sarah Malik, Jackie Tang, Giselle or Nian Nguyen, Anna Song, Maxine, May, Jessie Tu, Yen Rong, Wong, Marina Sano and so many others unmentioned to whom I'm so, so grateful. My audio book was read by Sun Park, who used to be in High Five, so I was very excited. And even before the book even came out, when it was still in its rough draft form, when it was still incomplete, Michelle Law bought the film rights. And it's taken 20 years and progression into middle age for this writer standing here today to finally feel like Taylor Swift and her girl gang, surrounded by all these crazy, talented, wonderful women operating at every level in the arts and literature. And I admire and appreciate you all so much. Amplified Bookstore, our official booksellers tonight, were one of the first to publicly stock and support my book pre-release. They are a bookshop that stocks diverse books because their motto is, everyone should be able to see themselves on the page. So for all disadvantaged writers out there, Forget about the maddening crowd of thoughts when you sit down to write. Your voice is not a cliche just because you are poor or Aboriginal or refugee or disabled or queer and you feel enormous amounts of pain. It's okay if you don't have the time or background to tweeze each word in place. If your writing is more like macrame rather than embroidery, if it's a distressed dresser rather than a polished tall boy. A once small publisher offered me refuge and made my career. Small presses are still offering refugee houses everywhere and larger publishers are now on the lookout for different, different voices. And there are mentorships, online publications, competitions and residencies open for you. The Deborah Cass Prize, the Next Chapter Mentorships, the Deacon Nonfiction Prize, just to name a few. So many opportunities out there and you can contact Writers Victoria to find out. So I've talked about 
production, promotion and reception of literature. I guess I should talk a little bit about longevity, but I think the last word of, on longevity I want to leave to the great Wu Yang Yu who says, I write, I live in this country, I send stuff out, I get rejected and I hardly get invited to any events literary or artistic. But that doesn't stop me from writing. As for whose taste matters, I say no one's taste matters to me. I once said that reading Wu Yang Yu is an acquired taste and that's what it is. If you don't like what I write, well and fine. I don't care. I create my own taste. I cater to no one's taste. We'll just see who dies earlier than who and whose taste lasts. Probably no one's. And that's even better. And so to finish off one final family story, you know, at dinner time, my dad, who's a funny man, likes to tell stories. And um, most people reckon they have embarrassing parents, but their parents in their formative years in their 20s and early 30s probably didn't survive a genocide. So my dad's funny stories revolve around surviving, you know, <laughs> his formative years. And one day we're eating chicken curry and my dad proceeds to tell us his story about when he made fertilizer out of human excrement in the killing fields of Cambodia, that was his job, in full detail. And he said, you know, I didn't get much of an education, but in those killing fields, I could have been a doctor. And I said, Dad, I don't want to hear your story. He said, you know what I could have been a doctor of? I could have been a doctor of pooology, of shit. I said, Dad, no, we're eating Thai curry. My dad said, I could tell whenever someone was going to die because their poo would be, you know, bright green. They had dysentery. I could tell when someone was going to live for the next week because their poo would be bright yellow. And, and I'd say, Dad, stop it. We don't want to hear this story. We're eating, we're eating curry. <laughs> and my dad said, I'm just talking about crap. You're not actually eating it. And he would proceed. So thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and around the world.